Chapter the Third of the Manchester Man by Mrs. G. Linnaeus Banks. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. How the Reverend Joshua Brooks and Simon Clegg interpreted a Shakespearean text. Manchester had at that date two eccentric clergymen attached to the collegiate church. The one, Parson Gatcliffe, a fine man, a polished gentleman, an eloquent preacher, but a bon vivant of whom many odd stories are told. The other, the Reverend Joshua Brooks, a short, stumpy man, so like to the old knave of clubs in mourning, that the sobriquet of the knave of clubs stuck to him, was a rough, crusted, unpolished black diamond, hasty in temper, harsh in tone, blunt in speech and in the pulpit, but with a true heart beating under the angular external crystals. And he was a good liver of another sort than his colleague. He was the son of a crippled and not too sober shoemaker, who, when the boy's intense desire for learning had attracted the attention and patronage of Parson Ainscuff, went to the homes of several of the wealthy denizens of the town to ask for pecuniary aid to send his son Joshua to college. The youth's scholarly attainments had already obtained him an exhibition at the Free Grammar School, which, coupled with the donations obtained by his father and the helping hand of Parson Ainscuff, enabled him to keep his terms and to graduate at Brasenose, to become a master in the grammar school in which he had been taught, and a chaplain in the collegiate church. So conscientious was he in the performance of his sacred duties, that albeit he was wont to exercise his calling after a peculiarly rough fashion of his own, he married, christened, buried more people during his ministry than all the other ecclesiastics put together. It was to this Joshua Brooks, few ever thought of prefixing the reverend in referring to him, that Simon Clegg brought Nan's orphan grandchild to be baptised on Tuesday the 7th of September, just three weeks from the date of his involuntary voyage down the flooded Irk. It had taken the tanner the whole of the week following his conversation with the beadle to determine the name he should give the child, and many had been his consultations with Bess on the subject. That very Sunday he had gone home from church full of the matter, and lifting his big old Bible from its post of honour on the top of the bureau, it was his whole library, he sat after dinner with his head in his hands and his elbows on the table, debating the momentous question. "'You see, Bess,' said he, "'a name as sticks to one all one's life is noan so small matter as some folk reckon, and yon's noan a common child. It's na every day, no, nor every year that a child is washed down a river in a caver and saved from ferry jaws of death, and I'd like to give un a name as a mak it remember it, and thank God for his mercy for preservation all th days o' his life. After a long pause during which Bess took the baby from the cradle, took a napkin under its chin, and began to feed it with a spoon, he resumed, You see, Bess, had no been cursing Simon, or might have been a cobbler, or a witster, or a waver, or out else. But feyther could read, though he could na write. And as he were a reed macker, he tout me my A B C, we crooking up th bits of wires he could na use into the shaps of th letters. And when aw could spell small words gradely, he tout me to read out o this very book. No read a Simon, a Tanner, and now to sarve me, but aw mun be a Tanner too. So thou sees. There's some to your name after all. Bess suggested that he should be called Noah, because Noah was saved in the ark, but he objected that Noah was an old greybeard with a family, and that he knew the flood was coming and built the ark himself. He was not taken unawares in his helplessness like that poor babby. Moses was her next proposition. Bess had learned something of biblical lore at the first Sunday school Manchester could boast, the one in Gun Street, founded by Simeon Newton in 1788, but Simon was not satisfied even with Moses. You see, Moses were put i' thark o' bulrushes o' purpose, and neither thee nor me's a pharaoh's doubter, and th' little chap not like to be brought up i' a palace. Towards the end of the week he burst into the room. I have it, lass, I have it. 
we'n go the lad Irk. Nobody'll ever name like that, and it'll tell its own story. And for the after name, o oh, reckon he mun tak ours. Marriages were solemnised in the richly carved choir of the venerable old church, but churchings and baptisms in a large adjoining chapel, and thither Bess, who carried the baby, was ushered, followed by Simon and Matt Cooper, who were to act as its other sponsors. At the door they made way for the entrance of a party of ladies whom they had seen alight from sedan chairs at the upper gate, where a couple of gentlemen joined them. A nurse followed with a baby, whose christening robe, nearly two yards long, was a mass of rich embroidery. The mother herself, a slight lovely creature, additionally pale and delicate from her late ordeal, wore a long plain skirted dress of vari-coloured brocaded silk. A lustrous silk scarf, trimmed with costly lace, enveloped her shoulders. Her headdress, a bonnet with a bag crown and quakerish poke brim, was of the newest fashion, as were the long kid gloves which covered her arms to the elbows. The party stepped forward, as though precedence was theirs of right, even at the church door, heeding not Simon's mannerly withdrawal to let them pass, and the very nurse looked disdainfully at the calico gown of the baby in the round arms of Bess, a woman in a grey duffel cloak and old-fashioned flat broad-brimmed hat tied down over the ears. Is there any thrill, sympathetic or antagonistic, in baby veins, as they thus meet there for the first time on their entrance into the church and the broad path of life, for the first time, but scarcely for the last? Already a goodly crowd of mothers, babies, godfathers and godmothers had assembled, a crowd of all grades, judging from their exteriors, for dress had not then ceased to be a criterion and all ceremonies of this kind were performed in shoals, not singly. The Reverend Joshua Brooks, followed by his clerk, came through the door in the carven screen between the choir and baptismal chapel, and took his place behind the altar-rails. And now ensued a scene which some of my readers may think incredible, but which was common enough then and there, and is notoriously true. The width of the altar could scarcely accommodate the number of women waiting to be churched, and the impatient Joshua assisted the apparitors to marshal them to their places with a sharp, You, come here! You, kneel there! You, woman's not paid! accompanied by pulls and pushes, until the semicircle was filled. But still the shrinking lady, and another, unused to jostle with rough crowds, were left standing outside the pale. Impetuous Joshua had begun the service before all were settled. For as much as it hath pleased, his quick eye caught the outstanding figures. Abruptly stopping his exordium, he exclaimed in his harsh tones, which seemed to intimidate the lady, What are you standing there for? Can't you find a place? Make room here, pushing two women apart by the shoulder. Thrutch up closer there. Make haste and kneel here, to the lady pulling her forward. You, come here. Make room, will you? And having pulled and pushed them into place, he resumed the service. Presently there was another outburst. There had been a hushing of whimpering babies, and a maternal smothering of infantile cries, as a chorus throughout. But one fractious little one screamed right out and refused to be comforted. The nervous tremor on that kneeling lady's countenance might have told to whom it belonged, had Joshua been a skilful reader of hearts and faces. His irritable temper got the better of him. He broke off in the midst of the psalm to call out, Stop that crying child! The crying child did not stop. In the midst of another verse he bawled, Give that screaming babby the breast! He went on. The clerk had pronounced the Amen at the end of the psalm. The chaplain followed. Let us pray. But before he began the prayer, he again shouted, Take that squalling babby out! An order the indignant nurse precipitately obeyed, and the service ended without further interruption. Then followed the christenings and another marshalling, this time of godfathers and godmothers with the infants they presented, in which the hasty chaplain did his part with hands and voice, 
until all were arranged to his satisfaction. It so happened that the Tanner's group and the ladies' group were ranked side by side. The latter was Mrs. Aspinall, the wife of a wealthy cotton merchant, who, with two other gentlemen and a lady, stood behind her, and this time gave her their much-needed support. Indeed, what with the damp and chillness of the church and the agitation, the delicate lady appeared ready to faint. "'Hath this child been already baptised, or no?' asked Joshua Brooks, and was passing on when Simon's unexpected response arrested him. "'Oh, do not know.' "'Don't know? How's that? What are you here for?' were questions huddled one on the other in a broader vernacular than I have thought well to put in the mouth of a man so deeply learned. "'Whoa, you see, this is the child as were weshed down the river with flood in a cather, an o' belonging lad a deed, and I'm uncursing him to mac o' oh, sure.' Joshua listened with more patience than might have been expected from him, and passed on with a mere humph to ask the same question from each in succession before proceeding with the general service. At length he came to the naming of several infants. Henrietta Bordelia Fitzborne was given as the proposed name of a girl of middle-class parents. Mm. Mary, I baptise thee, etc., he calmly proceeded, handed the baby back to the astonished godmother, and passed to the next regardless of appeal. Mrs. Aspinall's boy took his name of Lawrence with a noisy protest against the sprinkling, nor was the foundling silent when, having been duly informed that the boy's name was to be Irk, self-willed Joshua deliberately, and with scarcely a visible pause, went on, Jabez, I baptise thee in the name, etc., and so overturned at one fell swoop all Simon's carefully constructed castle. Simon attempted to remonstrate, but Joshua Brooks had another infant in his arms and was deaf to all but his own business. Such a substitution of names was too common a practice of his to disturb him in the least, but Simon had a brave spirit, and stood no more in awe of Joshua Brooks, Jotty as he was called, than of another man. When the others had gone in a crowd to the vestry to register the baptisms, he stopped to confront the parson as he left the altar. "'What right had you to change the name or choose to gi' that choilt? "'What right had you to saddle the poor lad with an irksome name like that?' was the quick rejoinder. "'Right? Why, I wanted to give the lad a name as should mak him thankful for being saved from drowning to the last days of his life. "'An irksome name like that would have made in the butt of every little imp in the gutters "'until he'd have been ready to drown himself to get rid of it.' Jabez is an honourable name, man. You go home and look through your Bible till you find it. Simon was open to conviction. His bright eyes twinkled as a new light dawned upon them. The gruff chaplain had brushed past him on his way to the robing room, but he turned back with his right hand in his breeches pocket and put a seven-shilling piece in the palm of the tanner, saying, Here's something towards the christening feast of the little chap I've stood godfather to. And don't you forget to look in chronicles for Jabez, and above all, see that the lad doesn't disgrace his name. Joshua Brooks had the character, among those who knew him least, of loving money overmuch, and this unwanted exhibition of generosity took Simon's breath. The chaplain was gone before he recovered from his amazement, gone with a tender heart softened towards the fatherless child thrown upon the world, his cynicism rebuked by the true charity of the poor tanner, who had taken the foundling to his home in a season of woeful dearth. And to his credit be it said, the Reverend Joshua Brooks never lost sight of either Simon or little Jabez. He was wont to throw out words which he meant to be in season, but his harsh abrupt manner, as a rule, neutralised the effect of his impromptu teachings. Now, however, the seed was thrown in other ground, and as he intended, Simon's curiosity was excited. The Bible was reverently lifted from the bureau as soon as they reached home, and after some seeking the passage was found. Simon's reading was nothing to boast of, but Cooper could not read at all, and in the eyes of his unlettered comrades, 
Clegg shone as a learned man. He could decipher black print, and that, in his days amongst his class, was a distinction. Slowly he traced his fingers along the lines for his own information, and then, still more slowly, with a sort of rest after every word, read out to his auditors, Bess, Matthew, and Matthew's wife, there in her best gown and best temper, with slight dialectal peculiarities which need not be reproduced. And Jabez was more honourable than his brethren, and his mother called his name Jabez, because she bare him with sorrow. And Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, O oh, that thou wouldst bless me indeed, and enlarge my coast, and that thine hand might be with me, and that thou wouldst keep me from evil, that it may not grieve me. And God granted him that which he requested. Eh, hey, Simon, mon, how jotty were woison o' thee. Theer's a name for a lad to stand by. It's as good as a leaping pow, that is, to help him o'er th brooks and rooks o' th wild. Simon sat lost in thought. At length he raised his head and remarked soberly, Parson Brooks might have been a prophet. Th child's mother did bear him with sorrow. The name fits the lad as if it had been made for him. Then no hope is a prophet o oh, out, father. No th rest'll come in time, briskly interjected Bess, adding, Come, tea's ready, further appending for the information of their visitors. Madam Clough sent the tea and sugar and the big curran loaf when a word as feyther had axed for holiday for the kirsnin and master clough sent some yale and a thumping piece of beef ay lass and as we're already a foine kirsnin feast we no change parson's seven shilling piece but lay it up for the laddie sen but the christening feast did not proceed without sundry noisy demonstrations from master jabez if as simon had once hinted he was an angel in the house. He flapped his wings and blew his trumpet pretty noisily at times. Eh, hey, lass, I oh, wish Tum were here now to enjoy yourself with us. I oh, wonder what he'd say to your nursing a babby so bonnily. Simon was munching a huge piece of currant cake as he uttered this, after a meditative pause. A look of pain passed over Bessie's face. She rarely mentioned the absent Tom, though he was seldom out of her thoughts. "'Yea, and oh, wish he were here,' she echoed with a sigh, the fountain of which was deep in her own breast. "'Oh, wonder where he is now.' "'Fightin', mebbe,' suggested her father. "'Killed, mebbe,' was the fearful suggestion of her own heart, and she was silent for some time afterwards. But the feast proceeded merrily for all that, and no wonder where Charity was president, and there was quite as happy a party under that humble roof in Skinner's Yard as that assembled in the grand house at Ardwick, where Master Lawrence Aspinall was handed about in his embroidered robes for the inspection of guests who cared very little about him, although they did present him with silver mugs and spoons and corals, and protest to his pale and exhausted mamma that he was the finest infant in Manchester. End of chapter the third.